Thank you for this enlightening talk, Professor Fitz. Thank you. Have you ever had an opportunity to give this message to the fanatics? Fanatics of religion, fanatics of beliefs, ISIS of the world. Have you Not had a chance to yet. talk with them and see what kind of response you have got? Not yet. I would be glad to do so. But the problem has been at our university that two years ago, the other full-time professor retired and uh, we did not replace him. I have a temporary person now and a few uh, adjuncts and I put together in 2014 a comparative philosophy major where we're going to study the philosophies of the world, all of them. No more of this, just Western. So to make a long story short, I'll be glad to, but I just it's just been go night and day to try. Can you imagine those of you who teach that last semester I taught three courses in seven independent studies? You know how much reading I had to do for those independent studies? So that's why not yet, but I'd love to. But Professor, this is a rhetorical question. Will they listen to, even if you are going to talk to them? Oh, not all of them, but it doesn't mean that people never listen. And I, th I don't think it's smart to go into the lion's den and just, like if I went to a Donald Trump, uh, one of his, whatever you're going to call him, you know, I'm not sure what to call him, are you? <laughs> so he'd probably throw me out, you know, he throws a lot of people out, so I would imagine I'd get thrown out. But if within a crowd, there are these people that, especially young people, and they're not sure which way to go, and maybe they've never been told about something like Ahimsa. Believe it or not, I started teaching at Mott St. Mary's years ago in California, and a young lady said to me, I can't believe it. She said, I've never studied ethics. I don't know anything about morality. I try to hold myself together and not fall down. <laughs> I kept a straight face and I said, really? <laughs> she said, yes. So there are a lot of them out there I think we could reach, but I don't think we want to walk into a, a room that's just full of them. You can debate somebody, that's fine, but I think you're right. Go ahead, you had a question. When intellectuals get a hold of an idea, they tend to color the world that, that color and say there's only that way. So can you distinguish the part of the, the world where ahimsa is not useful? And what do you put in that non-ahimsa part of the world? I don't. And Gandhi was asked a question similar to that. Most of you that know Gandhi's history know this. He was asked about what he would do, you know, if it, he had a chance to talk to Hitler. And he said, well, I would tell him what I thought. You know, it's not going to resonate, but he would tell him. And I don't think there's a time that Ahimsa doesn't work if you use it with reason. I teach critical thinking now. I used to teach formal logic. And uh, then I realized what the students needed more than anything in the world was to be able to reason clearly, consistently, coherently, and rigorously. So I'm teaching them that. And if they put their thinking caps on, as it were, I think we can figure out what to do in most situations. Not every situation. As you know, that's the utilitarian calculation. And that's used even in war, as you know. We, we try to think, well, what are the benefits that could come for this, from this act, and do they override any harm that would come? And that, those questions are really tough. So uh, I would say, in general, I think we can rely on it. Oh, I wanted to tell you one thing. That's an excellent question. I just thought of it. What I found out, and then what will get to you right away. What's going on here with all of us? Two things, I think. One are what the Germans call Weltanschauung, our worldview. How do we view ourselves in relation to the world? And the other is the attitude. What's this attitude inside? 
Is it accepting of human beings? Is it rejecting? Is that attitude such as all for self? Or is it for others? So that's a wonderful question. I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi, first, let me thank you very much for the deep philosophical talk you gave to us. I have a big question. Sure. Why? Can you find out what's the driver? Why the world is turning this way, more violent and more troublesome? What's driving us? I think that's changing that fast. I, I would say the one thing I said about attitude, but I also think a false value, and I think the drivers of God. Remember when I mentioned the paragraph? The wealth, the putting everything on money, and thinking if that's what's important, how much money we have, and uh, do, do our clothes, do our actions reflect that, our cars, are this or that, and the other. I think we have to get our values straight. And um, I think we have to understand, like, think of Lincoln and his son. Lincoln was so simple, so beautiful. I'm not saying he did everything right. No, no, no. But there was a beautiful soul. Beautiful. His body's beautiful. It's not features. It's even here. It's that light. And I think when you look at the son, Robert, oh my God. All the money and all the wealth and the railroad and this and that and the other. Where do your values go? Again, the giants are telling us you've got too much stuff, and I do. Then you're too focused on it, and you want to protect it. And uh, you know, do that to some other people. What are you doing? You're trying to get on my property. We have something on our road. I can't believe it. Mostly, I live in a wonderful little village uh, in many villages in uh, Connecticut in the north, in Woodstock, and she's, if we get on her property, oh, she's ready to take us to task. My dog got in with her donkeys. I thought she was going to have a condition. She said she's going to shoot him. I, and I told her, here I practice my ahimsa, because you know I love that dog. <laughs> so I said to her, no, you're not going to shoot. Just in that voice, no, you're not going to shoot the dog. <laughs> like that. But she quieted down. I lowered my voice. I didn't yell at her. I didn't tell you to touch my dog and now la 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 la. I said, no you're not. And she softened. Now this doesn't solve all the problems, but it's a lot of it. Because the individual makes up the individuals make up the collective. And I think we've got to get our values straight. Does that make sense? But, but how to propagate that? As you are saying, that we have to change the value system, we have got corrupt in that respect. How to curve it now in different direction? I think we have to teach the children. And another thing, everybody, all of you from India, please know that in the book that I'll put in the library here, I'm saying we need to. Um, take Ahimsa out to the world. Yes, it's India's. Yes, she did it. Yes, but give it as a gift. And let each country, each group of people, see it in their way. It's teaching. Teaching is always the answer. If it's good teaching. If it's sincere, if it's real. We have to work together as a people, not as separate little groups. It just doesn't work. And if you get some more ideas, will you write them? <laughs> yeah, a village. Yes. Another question there. Oh. Hi, Professor. Go ahead. I'll walk over here. Hi. I'm over here. Oh, I'm sorry. No, don't you be. First of all, thank you so very much for being who you are. Thank you. Um, you seem to have a, an ability to connect. I watched you going up and down and not using the, the microphones on the stand, but to, to communicate with people. I thank you for that. 
One of the things that concerns me is the leaderships that we have. You mentioned Mr. Trump. There are many Mr. Trumps, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And there are people out there who don't listen. And I look at young people sometimes, and I think they're much brighter than many of the leaders going around the world. To bring peace, how do we encourage people like yourself to welcome the respect and dignity of others, to live together and love each other? How would you do that with the politicians? Well, with the politicians, it may be a little late. I wrote a number of papers on Gandhi comparing him to Aristotle and to Confucius and uh, some other great thinkers, Plato. And uh, apropos of this, it seemed to me that you have to have an expectation. The society has to be strong, and it has to have an expectation that those leaders will be real leaders. And uh, how you develop this trustworthiness, that's what it's about. In fact, I gave this at Oxford University, and they published it. So if you write to me, I'll try to get a copy for you. Um, I think that all of us need to concentrate on the children. I, I'm not saying it's too late for adults, but sometimes it is. So let's work where we can work with the young people, as you said, who many of them are showing my former student here. He's now at one of your colleges at Brock, and he's getting his master's there, and then he'll come back with us to do probably in New Mexico to do his PhD, and just the same kind of work that I'm doing. And several more of them are wanting to do this. They're realizing we are a family of human beings, period. And I think if everyone helps in his or her way, we're not all able to directly affect leaders, but we can affect the people in our families. We can affect uh, husbands and wives can work together more strongly than they ever have before. Grandparents can be, uh, they kind of, as you are, a beautiful family. And I think that, uh, I was thinking about that last night when I left you, how they look up to you and, and how they're a continuation of your values and your beliefs. Is this a class coming? No. Oh, okay. So I think in little and big ways. Now we always think of a big fix, don't we? All of us do, right? I think we just do. It would be easier. I don't think it's going to be a big fix. Do you? I think it's going to be a lot of action on all of our parts. But please, please don't be complacent. I gave a talk not long ago. I kind of shocked myself. And these beautiful giant people. And I just saw what one of my dear friends, who's a Sanskritist, saw. He's seen it. I saw complacency. These some of the people and the giants of all people. And I just kind of let loose about not being complacent. It's easy for all of us. We're tired. You know, we're so tired. All the things that expect of us nowadays that our grandparents didn't have to do. Paperwork, this, that, the other thing. We'd like to say, hey, go away, world. You know, pull the covers over your head. Go away, world. Mm -mm. This isn't the time for go away, world. This is the time for us to act together and not let differences separate us. Where did we get off with that one?
We try to look at our religions and look at those parts that seem as if they're divisive. All of it. And think about it. We don't want it anymore. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Is that up here? I'm, I'm going to pass it back. I just want to say one word, and that is, in Unitarian circles, we have a phrase, love is a more powerful force for good than fear. Absolutely. And I think a lot of what we fight is fear. I'm going to pass it back. Uh, Professor, you touched upon uh, aparigra and distorted values in today's world. Do you think the root of all this is desires? When the desires go a little out of control, they turn into greed, and that leads to all kinds of other forms of manifestations of violence and... Well, you know in the Bhagavad Gita, which you will be studying, that's what they talk about. It translates, and it's kapha, kapha, kapha. it's kind of, uh, it's... Uh, an idea that desire is acting, and Buddha makes it stronger. He calls it a craving. So, yes, I think there's a lot there, and that, again, the Jains and the idea of Aparigraha make our lives a little more simple. Uh, I intend to try very, very hard to do this so that I have more time to do the things that are important. And that doesn't mean I'm going to go out and throw out everything I've got. That's silly. But I think that uh, desire can eat one up. Does that make sense? It just overcomes you. When you desire, you want more, and you want more, and you want more. You got this, now you want that. And on you go. Why? Why? We're here such a short time, darn it. You know, if I had anything to say to the powers, it would be, it would be, I'd like to live a little bit longer. 500 years? Gee, I could get some work done. <laughs> okay, someone over. Oh, here you are. Um, you talked about little things, and so I started looking at the way I was dressed, and I realized uh, an insult to Gandhi, I've come with leather shoes. Uh, I'm not sure about synthetics, how they're made, whether things are harmed, but a lot of us wear silk, and I... I think there's an inconsistency in all of us. I certainly haven't. I've got on silk. And, uh, and, oh, you think he, oh, wait till you're with the giants, not even pearls. But the thing about the leather shoes is they hurt. Those of us that ever wore high heels and all that, uh, they hurt. So when I was with the Giants, I could wear sandals during the summertime, but I don't know in the winter, and Gandhi did wear leather. They call it dead leather. Ha. You know, it's like, what? And it was the idea that the cow was already dead. Well, yeah, but if you perpetuate it, then you're still using leather. So I have a lot of those, and I have a lot with certain critters in the house. I haven't managed to get that right. The giants don't do that. Uh, the ants on top of the counter and the, oh, I have orchids, a lot of them. I love orchids. So these little mealy bugs get on there. And oh, I'm so glad to watch those orchids and they go down the drain. And it's awful. I shouldn't do that. So I'm working. I think it's a work in progress. I think, remember when I said earlier, get rid of that notion of perfection? And also, as somebody who works with how we think, let's stop this either-or stuff. Things are gradations. Yeah, go ahead. Where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I would first like to be excused because I have just walked in I'm a visitor in Canada. But uh, I've been a social scientist and a professor in many universities for the last ten number of years. And we do teach Gandhi. We do question. Today I have, I think, on my uh, iPhone or whatever phone I'm using, a number of comments on Gandhi and, and such, and what it means, the relevance of Gandhi. Good. But, but there is a problem. 
The problem is that you have made Gandhi sound like just a pure philosopher, a preacher who's teaching good values. He did that. But we cannot interpret Gandhiji without the context in which he was working. He was much more than a preacher. It was apartheid in South Africa. It was the national movement in India. It was the salt, uh, satyagraha, and so on. So, I mean, I find it a little hard to disconnect Gandhian thought from the context. Two things. You said you came in late. Yes. So you didn't hear no, the yes. part. And the book has all of that. And I said in the beginning, he had real problems. He had to overcome jealousy. He had to overcome dominance of his wife. He had to overcome uh, a number of things he'd done against his religion, eating meat, uh, stealing a couple times. Uh, but the hardest thing he ever had to overcome was his shyness. No, Gandhi would not want this. I said that in the beginning, too. He would tell us, don't deify me. He doesn't want that. And all that you say is in the book, and of course, but I'm trying to do 4,000 years of Ahimsa in, what, an hour or so? You can't do it. And if you hear that part, it's because I hold him in such high esteem. Oh, how, how wonderful. I know, I gave a talk there when I was in India, that was one of the talks, and his granddaughter was there with me, she was sitting right here. And uh, R.P. Jain, who's with Motilal Barnasi Das, he had arranged it. And uh, I'll never forget that walking in that garden that morning, and you have to take off your shoes now. And you walk and you feel the dew, and you know what happened. And you, you just got goosebumps all over you. And you look at a case. Here's the beauty of that Aparigraha I, I keep talking about. He's got, he's got, there's a, there's a big thing on the wall with glass. His sandals, his loony, his staff, and his glasses. Amen. That's what he had. And I tell myself when I get ready to go somewhere, Hope, what are you doing? May I not ask questions? Yes, yes. Hi. <coughs> You mentioned a few minutes ago that it is dangerous to go to a lion's den, which everybody agrees to that. But if you, if you tame a lion when they are small, That's what I think. You, you have dogs. The dogs are tamed That's right. to, be, to be polite, to treat, treat people up. I see. So well, my question is... answer to you, too. Start when you're young. That's so my it. question is, you are talking to people here whose mind is already set in many ways, different ways. Have you talked to the kids and the reaction? Oh, yeah, I'm a teacher. Ago, ago, talk to the kids who are being, uh, uh, being uh, indoctrinated by ISIS and other people. I will in time. I told you why. I don't have time right now, but I will. No, but right now, have we talked to the kids in the school about Ahimsa? And what is their reaction? All my students really love this. Oh, my goodness. In schools? He's there's from all walks of life. He can tell you. He's no, I, I mean the schools. Well, the mind is I know, but I don't teach. I teach in a university, so I know that some of them teach in the other schools. I don't. My experience is with uh, the older students, and some of them teach the younger students. Many of these young people are 
uh, my students tell me they're rude, they're, uh, especially in nursery schools, they're, uh, they'll swear at you, and so forth and so on. Parents have to learn to be parents. That's Confucius. He would never put up with that. A parent has to be a parent, and there's a real responsibility in being a parent and teaching those children to be respectful. So uh, you said something about, I wanted to cor uh, correct one kind of impression you seem to have. I don't mind walking into any lion's den, but I'm not going to walk where it's not going to do any good. You have to work where you can make some impact. So I think, rather than walking into a group of Donald Trumps, or working, walking into a, a group of uh, uh, people who have never learned anything, uh, the sociologist would know more about how to deal with young children than I, but I certainly can inspire them. I can do that. One last question we have, and then we will proceed. Thank you very much for a nice uh, lecture. Thank you. Uh, my question um, is not directly related to Ahimsa. You mentioned Aristotle and Plato, and uh, it was also mentioned in the introduction that you are doing comparative study of mm -hmm. uh, Indian philosophy and Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. We know a lot about what, how Greek, if, um, Greeks influenced uh, India, like uh, Gandhar, uh, civilization and all that, arts in other areas. Um, was it a one one way flow, or has there been uh, I evidence think of India on the other is side? the earliest. She's got the first school of philosophy period, Samkhya. We don't have the entire sutra. We only have the Karaka, but it's fabulous. And uh, missing pieces that would drive you crazy, but I knew a Sanskritist who had worked very carefully uh, and had uh, dismissed one of those um, translations that most of us by, um, I'm trying to think, Ishvara, uh, that he had done early on. And he said, no, no, no. Uh, this is really a dualistic system handling the idea of uh, evolution, handling the idea of gunas being in the world, three major ones, those of you that know Hinduism, and also part of our character. There is fabulous work here. And that's the earliest. This predates Plato by about 200 years. So the, and Hindu is a word we, we I don't know who had made it up, but the, the Indian people didn't call themselves that. But great thinking was going on. And I believe that the Hindus with the idea of rebirth influenced both um, the early, early thinkers in uh, Greece, particularly we think of Plato and before him Socrates. I, I wrote a paper on this, comparing them, and uh, there's no question that uh, these ideas that uh, the Greeks had, that many of them make sense in light of what happened with uh, in India. And if you compare the idea of being and becoming, you compare the ideas of uh, what I was talking about, these gunas, and he'd done something wrong, and he hadn't. So what I see uh, at uh, the ideas going on with Plato and how close they are to the Hindu I see him setting up a structure where your guardian rulers have complete control. And then there are your soldiers, those would be your Kasatrias, and then you have your merchants and your growers and blah, blah. And of course they had slaves too, but it's a closed system. Now, 
In India, it's clear through rebirth you can move up. It's not so clear in the Greek, but there is an idea, and they talk about it over and over and over, if you read uh, Plato's works carefully, that there is, in the level of the forms, when a soul goes out of body, it can be told in one of the famous passages, do you want to go forth with justice? Justice with the big one for them, with justice. If you don't, you're going to be born 10,000 times. You can discuss uh, this with uh, Professor Pitts later on, on the reception side. I think we have to uh, come to the close of the okay. questions. Uh, but uh, please give, give a big round of applause. For the